Well, thank you very much uh, for that reading. Just to say before I uh, begin to preach, I'm going to preach on the passage from Isaiah 61. And if you did get given a Bible on the way in or there's one near you, uh, you might find it helpful to turn to Isaiah 61 as we look at that passage together. But let me pray as we begin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I bring you good news of great joy. That's what the angels announced, isn't it? Um, Although this year, you might be thinking, uh, and you might be forgiven for thinking, How is it ever possible that Christmas in 2020 could be a time of great joy? After all, um, the threat of lockdown still looms. There's still a global pandemic out there. And all of us have to decide, don't we, as to which family members and friends we get to see this Christmas and which we don't. And yet, despite all of that, we see in glorious technicolor this morning, in our passage from Isaiah, why the good news of Christmas is such good news. Now, the passage may well be familiar to uh, a few of you. Um, You may recall that in Luke chapter 4, Jesus went to this passage to begin his public ministry. You can read there in Luke chapter 4, he he goes into his local synagogue, he takes the scroll off the shelf, uh, and he unrolls it, and he begins to read Isaiah 61. And as he reads it, he looks at everyone present in the synagogue, and he declares to them, today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. You see, Jesus was convinced that uh, Isaiah 61, more than any other passage in the Old Testament, summed up the very reason that he had come. It encapsulated his whole ministry. It's for that reason that I'm kind of persuaded that we should call Isaiah 61 the gospel according to Isaiah. Because that's really what it is. In fact, if you have a look at verse 1, you'll see just that. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. That word there in the Hebrew, in the, in the Greek translation, good news, is euangelion. It's exactly the same word that you'll find in the Gospels. Gospel. Good news. Now, uh, Not only is Isaiah 61 uh, a relatively long chapter, but but Isaiah is a long book. 66 uh, chapters. So it's worth getting our context before we look through this a little bit. Um, And as was mentioned at the beginning of our reading, is absolutely the case. Uh, uh, Isaiah writes and pictures at this moment Israel, God's people, in exile, in captivity, to the great superpower of the time, Babylon. You see, Israel had proven unfaithful to God and their promises to him. They'd proven unfaithful to their covenant. They had rebelled against the Lord God, and so God, in his justice and his judgment, had sent them into exile. So Babylon had come. It had desecrated the land. The temple had been devastated, and they'd been taken into exile. And it's into that context that Isaiah writes these verses in chapter 61. It's worth noting that although Isaiah writes this, it's not actually Isaiah speaking. The one who is speaking at this moment is this enigmatic and mysterious figure known as the servant of the Lord, the servant of the Lord, who is the Messiah. Or in, again, Greek, the Christ, God's 
promised saving king. Now, although this whole chapter is, is in a sense, the gospel according to Isaiah, it's pretty helpful as we go through it to, to divide it into three. I'm afraid you're going to find out uh, when, I, when I preach that I'm quite fond of headings. So I'm going to give you three headings as we go through this passage. The first one is this. It's Isaiah's gospel. The second one is Israel's blessing. And the third one is our response. So first of all, Isaiah's gospel. That's verses one to three. Here we see this servant, this Christ, speaking and declaring his mission. But remember, he's he's speaking to a people who have proved utterly unfaithful to God. Back in chapter 1 of Isaiah, they'd been described and pictured in terms of an unhealthy body. Isaiah said, from the top of your head to the bottom of your toe, you are completely unsound. That's what this people had proven to be. And yet, this servant, this Christ, opens his mouth to them in chapter 61, not with deserved judgment, but with undeserved grace. And declares in verse 1, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. It is astonishing that these are the words that are being delivered to Israel. And notice that this, this servant doesn't just proclaim this as though he were kind of like a TV news reporter reporting the news. Now look again at verses two to three. Verse 2, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And verse 3, to provide for those who grieve in Zion. You see, what this servant proclaims, he also provides. This Christ has the power and authority to provide what he proclaims. Good news for the poor. Freedom for the captives. The year of the Lord's favour, comfort to all who mourn. And this good news is an utter reversal. I don't know if you noticed that in verse 3. Did you notice as it was read, the the three insteads in verse 3? Let me just read those to you again. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy, instead of mourning, and a garment of praise, instead of a spirit of despair. Utter reversal. That is what the good news of the gospel is all about. God coming in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, and transforming our experience and our existence from despair to joy, from captivity to freedom, from isolation to community, from death to life. This is Isaiah's gospel. Secondly, Israel's blessing, verses 4 to 9. In these verses, we see even more clearly the working out of this good news in God's people Israel. What will the effect be for them? Well, look at verses 4 to 7. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Restoration. But especially look at verse 9. Their descendants will be known among the nations, their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. There are echoes here all the way back to that first original promise God made to the first person he called, Abraham. Do you remember Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3? Out of all the peoples on the earth, God chose one man, Abraham, and said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you into a great nation. 
I'm going to give you a land and I'm going to bless you. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And as we follow that promise down, God promises from that great nation, I'm going to call one individual. And from that one individual, I will bless the world. You see, though this is good news, it is not new news. God's gospel of salvation was never plan B. This is God's plan of salvation from all time for the world to make a people for himself and through that people, through an individual from that people, to bless the world. And just as God always intended, through Jesus, through that in individual, the blessings have overflowed to the world, to every single one of us who comes to Jesus through repentance and faith and find his blessings poured out upon us. I wonder if you get this. Do you get it? They used to say, didn't they? They used to say, uh, a puppy is for life, not just for Christmas. Well, the point here is, the good news of Christmas, of the gospel, isn't just for Christmas. This is God's plan of salvation forever, for everyone. It's what the whole of history has been about. It's what, what the whole of creation is for. God sending his servant, his Christ, his son to us, a light in the darkness to reconcile us back to himself and know his undeserved blessings forevermore. And as we move on, just before we do, to the final verses of this chapter, did you notice who this good news was, is for in the reading? As Ray mentioned last week, this is not the gospel according to Santa. It's not, it's not those who are on the good list that get the blessings. It's the opposite. Or as Jesus would say himself when he came, I've not come for the healthy but for the sick. I've not come for those who think they're righteous, but for those who know they're sinners. This is good news, not for the comfortable, the safe, and the happy, but for the struggling, the weak, and the helpless. I wonder if that's you. I wonder whether you feel far from God at the moment. Lockdown has had a kind of impact on all sorts of things, and, and we mustn't be surprised if it has an impact on us spiritually as well. Do you feel far from God at the moment? Do you know your unworthiness? Do you, do you know your need of God? Do you not even dare to dream that God could be for you? Well, if that's you, this gospel is for you. Remember, this good news came to Israel not while they were doing great, but at the lowest of lows. Whilst they were in judgment for their unfaithfulness. It wasn't a call here in Isaiah 61 of, O come all ye faithful, but O come all ye unfaithful, come back to me. Return to me, follow me, and I will bless you. Isaiah's gospel, Israel's blessing, finally, our response this morning, verses 10 to 11. In these last two verses, the servant is still speaking, but he's not speaking on his own behalf. He's speaking words for the community of the saved to join in with him in response. He's kind of speaking a liturgy for everyone to join in with. Verse 10. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. 
this is a gift. These two final verses are a gift to us from the servant to join in with our response to God, your response to give God the praise and the glory for his amazing, undeserved grace towards us. So as we finish, yes, yes, even in 2020, the good news of Christmas is something of great joy. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you for your undeserved grace and mercy towards us, your people. Lord, we praise you for the gift of your servant, your son, your Christ, our Saviour, who has come to us to, to, to provide though, that utter reversal and transformation for us, to bring us out of darkness into light, to bring us out of isolation into relationship, to bring us out of mourning into joy, to bring us out of death into life. Lord, send your spirit upon us that we would give you the praise for your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.